Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Hi, everyone. Our guest today is Dr. Scarlett Heinbuck, and she was a presenter at the Afterlife Awareness Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah, that we had the pleasure of live streaming. That live streaming is still available for you to purchase if you would like, and she is going to talk a little bit about uh, the presentation that she's giving, Energy Healing in the Clinical Setting, that will be presented there at the conference. But she also has a a shared near-death experience with a gentleman by the name of David Schwartz. She also wrote a book about it called Waking Up to Love, Our Shared Near-Death Encounter Brought Miracles, Recovery, and Second Chances. So I'm very excited to have this conversation with her because as many of of you know, I'm an energy healer and also a licensed mental health therapist. So talking about energy healing in the clinical setting is a conversation I've had with so many people who are kind of afraid to branch out into that direction, to blend the two. So I know that this is going to be an excellent conversation that we're going to have, and also the topic of the shared near-death encounter. So I couldn't be more excited to introduce you guys to Dr. Scarlett. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for being a guest here on the Path 11 podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really, really delighted to to be on the podcast and and to, to just have this conversation. I know it's going to be wonderful. Yeah, and I I have to tell you, it comes at such an interesting time. Uh, Reading about your background, uh, just to let our listeners know, you hold a PhD in public policy and administration from Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, VCU, and also have a master's degree in public health from VCU School of Medicine. You're also certified Reiki master teacher in the USUI system of natural healing, just like myself. And you've studied complementary, alternative, integrative medicine for more than 25 years. You're an energy practitioner as well. And just this week on Tuesday, you and I are recording this on a Friday. I have a client of mine who is a massage therapist by trade. She too got her master's degree and has a public health background, but she is also exploring these alternative therapies. And she said, I don't know how to be my true authentic self, blend these and bring this world over into the public health world. So I sent her an email this morning. I said, you're never going to believe this. I am getting the opportunity to talk to this woman and take a look at her background. So this podcast is dedicated to her. I know she listens to the show um, and I couldn't be more excited really for her that I get to have this conversation with you to be able to also give to her. Um, And I think that you're going to help so many people as we discuss, like, how do we blend these two worlds together of energy healing and the clinical setting? So I think we have lots to talk about. And maybe you can uh, start with just kind of telling us how you kind of came into public policy and administration and public health and then, you know, find yourself becoming a certified Reiki master teacher. Okay. Well, you know, we've got a lot of ground to cover and, but, you know, the first, the, the, the original reason why I really began looking into energy healing was because of my children. I, as a mom, I had two sons at the time who both had disabilities. My oldest son had severe ADHD and my youngest had epilepsy. And so trying to find answers to, to help my children because the standard models weren't really working for them. Um, you know, we did all the traditional things with medication and therapy to, to try to help diet, nutrition, um, things that I was learning about and, and those things did help, but it wasn't enough. And so, um, I began to learn more about energy healing to help soothe my children, to help, uh, heal and, and, and calm and just work with them in their energy levels, trying to understand what might be going on for them as well as what, I could do that would help. So as I continued on in this learning mode, I became more aware that I wanted to to understand research. I wanted more uh, validation because I found that that I was very research oriented and it was important to me when I was talking to my son's doctors and, and other clinicians that I understood 
what they were up against in terms of their models that they were working with and how I could find a way to bridge that gap to communicate with them about some of these other modalities. Um, and something as basic as most of your listeners probably are very aware of about nutrition, a lot of the time people at that time did not really even understand that. So I had a, a pretty big bridge to, to walk. So one of the ways that I did that was to to educate myself by going to school to understand research methodology, understand how to really design a good study so that I could find a way to see if we could eventually measure this. So as I went along, I continued working with my children over the years. They, they got better um, and things continued to improve. And I found that um, I seemed to have a gift for helping other people with, with working with energy. So I continued to explore it while also being a single parent and working full time. And then I ended up going back to school to get my doctorate in um, public policy. At that time, I'm being in Virginia, I was in Richmond and, and they didn't have a doctorate in, in, public health. So I ended up going to public policy, seeing how I might be able to use what I was learning to advance the way that we work with people in, in public health settings. So again, I'm no stranger to kind of putting together different places, um, different modalities and different disciplines. So that's pretty much what got me started on my path with, with energy healing. Wonderful. And I'm going to ask this question for some of the moms out there that might be listening that do have children with epilepsy and ADHD. And I think that it would be nice just to spend a few minutes on that. So maybe you can give some direction to parents who might be looking for other alternatives to help their children and maybe how you saw your children improve with everything that you did to work with them through, like you said, the energy healing, the nutrition and all of that. But what did you find um, really help them the most? And what are some other things that parents can do with their own children that might be going through these um, difficult times? Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I'll be the first to, to say in, in response to that, that I am fully integrative. So what that means to me is that I embrace whatever works for your children. So I'm not at all anti-medication because I find that some of our children need that. And to me, it's all healing. What it is for me is understanding what's going to help the most and with the least amount of side effects. So that's what I look at. So, uh, you know, when I started this journey with my children, I had found that the fields were very divided um, with some mom saying no medication ever and others saying, well, you know, that's it, nothing natural. And I thought, again, bridging that gap because it is always a both and. And you have to look at uh, your own child's uh, symptoms and how they're functioning in the world. And if medication is useful and helpful for them, then it's an important tool in the toolbox because ultimately the whole thing is for your child as a parent to not suffer and to help them function and, and, and be as well as they can be. So, um, you know, so I did a little bit of both with both of my children while exploring the basics of nutrition. So what I found that was extremely helpful for both of my boys were essential fatty acids. And that's things like the omega-3s, your fish oils, um, things that now we know are so important. But at that time, no one had ever really heard so much of fish oil. So when I began to research how important that was for brain development, and it's also, you know, a catalyst for vitamin D, and a lot of our children are vitamin D deficient, which also impacts a lot of these learning issues and kids, children with autism as well, often have vitamin D deficiencies. So all of that's incorporated in essential fatty acids, which can be found in, in things again, like the fish oil. So people, and at that time didn't know a lot about it, but I found that it was extremely helpful in both of my boys and, and helping them with their symptoms and calming down and just, just, really having a powerful effect on how they were feeling and behaving. Also, at I was really looking at the role of diets. I export everything. And I, you know, I looked at fine gold diet. I looked at um, 
ketogenic diet. I looked at everything that could be useful. Uh, ultimately, what I ended up doing was I, I started out getting a little extreme and that kind of backfired because kids are kids and they're not going to always stick to these very strict <laughs> diets, as most parents will tell you. So right. I had to learn to be, um, you know, a little less overzealous about it because we have to still live in this world with the, the world realities and the, the way things are. So, you know, we, we had to, it was a delicate dance and we had to find our way. But what we did find is that the children, my boys became more selective about what they ate and they did it internally as I spent time with them, you know, just explaining things. And I, one of my um, sons told me the other day that he never forgot something I did to, to really drive home the point to him about how important water is and, and good choices. He said, mom, do you remember the time when you held a, a Coke can over a plant and asked me if I should put this Coke in this plant? And, and I remember saying, oh no, that would be terrible for the plant. And he, he said, and that's when it hit me that you were making the point that Coke would not be good for me either. If it wasn't good for that plant, why would it be good for me? Mm -hmm. And he told me about that and, and that that had made him understand in a way that all the words I had said never did. And yeah. he's 31 now, not my oldest son, and for him to to have that memory and he now uses that as an example of, you know, hey, this is this is it. You wouldn't give a plant Coke and junky foods and expect it to thrive. Why would you put that in your own human body? So I tried to, to find ways that would help them to see why it was important rather than me just telling them. So, you know, what we had to find and stumble our way through and it, it wasn't an easy process and it wasn't quick. But I will say that both of my boys are, are doing very well today. Um, you know, my youngest still has epilepsy. It's used, it's controlled very well through minimal medication and essential fatty acids. And my older son takes his vitamins and he's doing very well. So I'm grateful. I'm very, very grateful for, for what we learned during those uh, many, many years. Yeah, so I hope that, you. you know, some of that might be helpful for some of the moms. I'm sure it will. And I bet you everyone listening is going to use that Coca-Cola example. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> what a great visual. And you are, you know, so right. Um, so yeah. So thank you for that. So um, kind of switching gears a little bit, let's begin to talk a little bit more about how you begin to blend energy healing in the clinical setting. And maybe, uh, you know, we might be speaking to that audience out there where we might have closet Reiki practitioners, right? Or people like on the weekends or, you know, it's like they have this whole separate spiritual life and then they go to work and they're trying to figure out, gosh, I have so much knowledge, but how do I bring this into a clinical setting or into work that might be more focused in the field of, uh, you know, medical or medicine or something really that could be maybe not even in a clinical setting per se, but you know, right. how, how do we begin to blend, uh, that energy practitioner into their world of work? Well, I, I start, let me start by telling you a little background on me. My mother is a retired career nurse and she was always very interested in learning anything that she could that would help her patients feel better. Um, she worked with patients in all types of settings in the emergency rooms and hospice all time for her entire career was just always in very intense areas. And she took um, a class in therapeutic uh, touch, I believe, not there. Yeah, I think it was therapeutic touch. And it was taught by a nurse, the, the Dolores Krieger model. And so her hospital at the time actually asked her to take the training and to teach the student nurses, which she did. And I remember years ago when I, I had a, a a terrible headache I'd gone to visit and she said well sit down let me show you something so she waved her hands around my head and I felt the sensation of, of pulling like rubber bands pulling from my head and in less than a minute my headache was gone and I was amazed at this I was like, How, what did you do? And she said, well, that's what energy healing is. And I became absolutely fascinated by that at that point. And, and from then on, went on to learn. Now, I, I'm not a nurse, 
So I looked at some other models and Reiki was one that was universally available and, and, and used very much the, the same types of principles as the therapeutic touch, healing touch. They're, they're different, um, systems, but the, the, you're working with the same thing. You're working with the body's energy field. And in that practitioner mode, you yourself are going within to your place of grounding to your source energy of healing. And for me, that's tapping into love and love can be whatever people, you know, want to put a name on it. But the source energy for me is, is just that absolute beautiful, unconditional love. And so that's the space that my mother would always be in when she was working with her patients. And this was something that she could do in conjunction with her daily work. So she showed me that um, there didn't have to be a separation. And, and so I began to understand that. Now, I had not gone necessarily into a clinical um, field. I mean, it was more of a study, a researcher, a student, um, parent, and, and just trying to to do more. But what happened was I found that as I continued developing after I'd taken Reiki, it took me seven years to really from the beginning till I got my mastership in it because I really wanted to understand what I was doing. And I'm sure like you and, and every other healer I've met, you know what an enormous responsibility it is when you're working with somebody else's energy field. Yes. It's a very sacred um, exchange. And I look at it from I'm not a healer necessarily, I'm a healing facilitator because the person is their own healer. And my role and the way that I see it is to facilitate them and their healing gift because everybody has has it themselves and it's truly what what they choose to receive and, and expand from. So that's what I began to learn and, and what I found is um, when I worked with people it generally seemed to be I'd get a call that um, someone was in a very dire situation and could you go, Can, you know, just go hold their hand or, or say a prayer because I used to be on a prayer team at the church I was attending at the time. And it was um, using the, the tools of affirmative prayer, the power of words and the choices that you made. So I had learned that as well. And so when I began to, to do that, I would talk to people in addition to doing the energy work and the things that I would say would be very validating toward whatever they wanted to heal. And, and so I would combine that with what I would see in my mind's eye of them being whole, well, healthy, and, and being in their very highest and best. So I would hold that vision for them. And it didn't matter how far away from that they might be at the moment I was with them. I just held that vision knowing that just like healers, we walk in two worlds. We walk in the physical world and we walk in the world of energy and we're doing it simultaneously. And so I would see that person, no matter what the physical appearance seemed, their higher being was healthy and whole and well. And so I would hold that energetic space for them. So I'm hoping that's making some sense and how I'm explaining it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and maybe we could even, uh, this might be a really nice bridge to go into how you met David Schwartz back in okay. September of 2005 and how you okay. were working with him. And let's hear more about this, uh, shared near death experience. Okay. Well, and, and a little background on that. Um, as when I was a really little kid, I was able, I had my own near death experience when I was four years old. And I recently found this out. I had not really remembered. Um, and my mother remind me, reminded me of it, that I had nearly drowned in a neighborhood pool and she found me on the bottom of the pool, got me out and, uh, revived me. Um, but I, I remembered from that experience feeling a sense of peace and love and floating and, so I think that there's a connection there. And I was also extremely intuitive as a child. I was able to see spirits. I, I knew things that there was no way I could have known. So I had a lot of uh, abilities, I think, from a young age that kind of helped me to to be able to be out of my body, to be in a more loving space and know that one did exist. So 
Anyway, as I continue developing, a friend of mine, and I'm, I'm very upfront about this in my book, and I'll be upfront about it on, on the podcast too. I had, um, with all the stress of dealing with my children, even as I was stumbling along with this, um, there were times when I was feeling very down and discouraged because it was very hard, and I felt like um, I was drinking too much. So I ended up going to an AA meeting, and I just say that because it's um, important to the story. And so a friend of mine was telling me about their friend and saying that this person was, um, had been stricken with an illness that no one knew what had happened and ended up in the hospital and now was in a a coma and all systems had shut down and, and, um, the person was on life support, their lungs, uh, they'd gone into acute respiratory distress and then acute renal failure and then had all these other things going on. And so, um, this person turned out to be David. And so I met his mother. I never had met David before, but I met his mother who was called in, um, from San Francisco for the third time to come say goodbye. And I met her that night at a meeting and she touched my heart. There was just something so amazing about her and her, um, you know, just her strength, her, her resilience here. She was seeing her son and she told everyone that she had signed the funeral directives that day that they didn't expect him to survive, that he had been in that coma for going on four weeks at that point. And, um, everything had shut down. He had not responded to the treatment protocol and he'd had a very rare form of vasculitis, which, um, at that time is called Wegner's granulomatosis. And so many times people didn't survive that, but nowadays they can, but there's usual permanent, uh, disability, um, if people live because it, it damages the organs to uh, just a, a terrible level. And so when I heard about David and what had happened and I saw people who knew him were staying around crying because he wasn't going to make it. Uh, it just touched my heart. So I was going to say to her, you know, Hey, I'm really sorry about what's going on. But instead what came out of my mouth was I said, I don't think you should give up hope yet. And so she looked at me like, well, what do you, you know, what do you mean? Because this is not really, um, going to work too well here. And I said, well, I told her that I did Reiki and, and healing prayer. And if she would like me to go visit her son the next day that I would do that. Um, if she wanted. And so he was in the uh, cardiac care unit because in addition to everything else, his heart was out of rhythm and AFib. And uh, so she said, yes, okay. And I went to go see him the next day. Um, You know, I wasn't even sure if he would be alive, but he was. And that's how I ended up um, going to go see him. And so he was um, at that time, as I said, he was an AFib and he had the acute renal failure and acute uh, respiratory distress. He'd also had a lung that had collapsed and they'd had to put in a chest tube. He had uh, blood clots. He had double pneumonia. He had sepsis. He, it, it, when we talk about this now, you know, it's almost amazing. Uh, when we've spoken about people say any one of those things wouldn't be survivable. And so when you put or couldn't be survivable. But when you put them all together, it's, it's just how, how was even hanging on at that point? So I, I went into work with him and this is really important. And I know all the healers get this, so you'll get it. Even though he was in that coma state, I introduced myself as though he were awake and could hear me. And I had remembered that my mom had always said, people can hear you even if they're not conscious. So be careful what you say and treat them as though they're awake. So I introduced myself and asked his permission. And that was critical because I've also learned as I'm sure everyone else who does this too, you know, people, people have choices to make in these situations about, um, this is their soul journey. So do they want to be here or do they don't? And, and so it's not up to me to make that that decision or to force healing on anybody who doesn't want it. Um, but what I wanted to do was be there in the presence and see what he wanted. So what I did was I asked his permission and I told him that this was his choice, that he was in control, that he was empowered and I could hear his decision and I would wait patiently to see if he would like for me to work with him or not. 
And so I stood there and as I did, I felt this little puff of air because the only thing in the room at that point were just the machines going. And so I said, okay. So I took his hand very gently, uh, careful not to dislodge anything. He had an IV line and he had in you know, the pulse oximeter and all the medical things and bags and everything that, that a person who's critically ill has. And I, took his hand and I said an opening prayer and my prayer was very specific. It was saying whatever his highest and best was under this dimension and any other, um, and only the most sacred and holy energies here and present today for, for him. And I asked him whatever he chose to do, whether he wanted to stay in this life, if he had unfinished business, I would, um, do what I could to help him to return. And if he chose to go, to know that he was loved, that a lot of people loved him and that he was, he was just absolutely loved in this realm and in others. And so whatever he chose would be okay. And as I went around and I did some, uh, very light energy work, because at that point he, his energy was very flat. He, he did not feel like he was in his body. And honestly, my sense of it was that he was, he was transitioning out um, so I, I stood there, uh, as I finished up and, and I was getting ready to leave. And I told him that if he made the decision that he wanted to, to, to come back and to, to stick around, I would make a promise and a commitment that I would come back and work with him if that's what he would like. So as I was getting ready to leave, I took his hand to say goodbye and to just do a little closing energy seal. And as I did, I was getting ready to leave and, and I found that my hand was sort of stuck to his, it, he had no grip, so he wasn't holding on and it, and I couldn't quite pull my hand away. So I realized that his energy was reaching back mm-hmm. and it was at that point that I was like, there, he's making a, a spiritual, uh, connection here back. So he's, he's there. He's there. And that's when I stood there and I said, okay, okay, I hear you. And I said, I, I will be back. I will be back. And so that's, that's when we began our healing journey. Do you have any questions at that point before I, well, no, but my question might lead to where you're going next, because then I'm curious to know when he did come back and make a recovery, Mm -hmm. um, was there anything that he remembered from your session? Well, what happened was, let me just give you the overview. I worked with him for 12 full days. Um, For the first week, I came daily. And for the second week, I came twice a day. Um, When I came back, I, I worked with him for, I came every day. And again, he was in complete kidney failure. And I, I, I had never seen anyone in, in, in acute kidney failure. So I didn't realize that they're, that they were swollen and he was, but after I started working with him on about the second, third day, he began to produce urine, which was amazing because at that point his kidneys had been damaged to the point that they said if he even survived, he would um, need dialysis permanently or a transplant if he would even qualify for it. So, um, so we knew that that was pretty amazing. So when about the fourth, fifth day that I was working with him, I had an experience when I began the opening prayer as I always did, I took his hand and all of a sudden I was out of my body and I was in another realm of love. And it was nothing but pinpoints of light, the bright, bright white light, like millions and millions of dots of it. And I call it like liquid love, even though it's not wet, I just don't have human words to describe the texture and the, the, the sense of it, except that it wasn't a living energy and I was in it and of it. And that's where I met David on that realm, his spirit. And as I was there, he was there in front of me and I was still holding his hand in the spirit realm. And that's when, um, I knew my spirit opened and I had this knowing that I have, my soul has always known this man. I have always known him and always loved him. And it was the most incredible kind of love. It wasn't like romantic love. It's 
the best I can describe is the every kind of love. It's, it's just everything that you can possibly imagine the unconditional, the, there's nothing, nothing that he could have ever done that wasn't, he wasn't loved. It was just stunning. And then the connection and recognizing that this was a spiritual, uh, my soul partner and that I knew him on this level. And then I was plopped back in my body and I'm standing there at his bedside. He is still unconscious and I am not knowing what happened, except that I'm now seeing him with completely different eyes and just totally stunned by the experience. I went on and con- and continued with working with him, just just shocked. I was like, "This can you know, this can't be my soulmate. Now can this be?" And but as um and I worked with him for those twelve days, and we had some very unusual other experiences. Um, involving other uh, healing beings from other dimensions that I, uh, it took me 13 years to write about that, but I put it in the book. But anyway, when he woke up finally, and he said he didn't have a strong memory of all of the details, what he had was the soul memory. He said when he woke up and saw me, he didn't even know my name, but he knew everything else about me. He said he knew who he knew me on a spiritual level. He knew that I had struggled. He knew my he knew I had sons. He knew everything on my soul level. And he knew that he was going to marry me. <laughs> and he knew that I he was meant to be with me. And he had he said later, you know, he knew that he made that choice to return. And he did. And when he began to really heal, the nurses and doctors, and he was in a Catholic hospital here in Richmond, began to call him Miracle Boy because, again, there was just no explanation for how he was healing and returning and and reviving. And so he made a stunning recovery. And we, we, I called a miracle, unexpected recovery. There's all kinds of language around it, but the bottom line is there's no explanation why his kidneys are perfect today, um, why his health is perfect today, because most people who had what he had are are usually in um, needing lifelong continuation of medication. But he's been in full remission for all these years. Um, his health is is excellent, and we we just are so grateful, you know that he had this healing miracle and it turned out he was right. We ended up getting married, I guess about seven months later, he was buck up on his feet. It took a while for him to get full recovery, um, to redevelop his lung capacity and things like that. But, but that was it. And we just both knew we were meant to be together from then on. And we have been, so we got married in June of 2006 and it's pretty amazing to be to believe that you know this this fall it'll be 14 years since this whole experience but so that's part of what makes this a very unusual healing story is it's also how two soulmates met in another dimension (laughs) and and that's how i met my husband (laughs) wow 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 i i love this story and you know um it reminds me of it's another show that i am in the works of collecting stories um for it's called synchronistic sundays to hear stories exactly like this that make people just say wow and you just can't make it up and there's no such thing as a coincidence you know it's just like you can't you can't deny and that is amazing well, thank so you amazing. Amazing. yeah it was the last thing i ever expected <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so wow oh gosh now and i know that you guys um fast forwarding to this year of 2019, August uh, 29th through September 1st, you guys are actually going to be talking about your shared near death experience on a panel. Um, and do you want to tell people about this event where they could find you? Sure. That's going to be with the International Association of Near Death Studies. Uh, most people know it as IANS. And this is their annual conference, which is, again, an international event. And it's going to be in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania at, during that time, 
of um, August uh, 28th or 29th. I can't remember now, but through then. And we're going to be speaking on that panel um, for the shared near-death experience. Uh, the thing, too, that's very interesting is more and more people are reporting shared near-death encounters that you've heard of most people have heard of near-death experiences and now there's something called shared death which is where a person is able to spiritually travel somewhat with someone who is dying and as that person completes the death process the other person who's had some of that uh, journey with them is returning to their body and so a shared near death where David was dying and I was able to go there and be with him and he made the, the, instead of completing the death process, he made a miraculous recovery and return to life. This is what's very unusual about our story. But we're, so we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about the interdimensional beings because they're a very important part of his healing in terms of his kidneys which were, as I said, damaged um, irreparably at that point, but now they're they're perfect. And he had some very unusual experiences with that, which I, I saw the these interdimensional beings, this healing team uh, that appeared to me uh, to be blue in color, and they replaced mm -hmm. his kidneys. And when I say that, I think, well, that sounds really odd, and that's why it took me a long time to even talk about it, except that Dave and I spoke at IANS in 2015 and shared our story, and when we kind of reluctantly shared about the blue beings replacing his kidneys, we were told that people are having these experiences all over the world with these blue beings, mm -hmm. and, and um, I had not known that, so finding that out has certainly sparked my interest in wanting to know more, but it, anyway, but we will be speaking at this IANS, um, in, in August over that, that holiday weekend. And I hope that people can come because it's a wonderful conference and there's so many amazing speakers there, um, sharing all types of experiences about this. And of course, um, you know, just, just, the interest level of people because people I believe are becoming even more open and more spiritually aware. And, and so they're, and they're having these types of experiences. So the more we can just give truth and, and voice to these experiences without fear of judgment, which is tough, but again, you share the story and then people say, well, you know, I, I had that experience too, but I was afraid to say anything about it. Uh, for fear of what think, people might think. So, um, but that's that's what's happened. We had to take that leap of faith because both of us had been in the mainstream world in terms of work for a long time, and David still is. But we finally said, you know, life is short and we're here for a reason. And we had this this incredible experience for a reason. And, and we need to share it with people and let them draw their own conclusions and, and and also find their own stories and, and find uh, permission, if you will, to tell their truth because there are so many things that our people are experiencing that they just need to be able to share. So that's one of the reasons why we're, we're speaking now um, nationally and, and internationally. In fact, we spoke in Hungary last year and briefly with um, another organization, well, one of the international IANS groups. And one of the gentlemen there who hosts it, his name is Tibor Putnaki, and he um, was clinically dead for nine minutes. He also had an encounter with these blue beings. He also had a miraculous recovery. So, you know, just finding these stories all over, and one of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, how do you contact these beings? <laughs> you know, how did this happen? <laughs> And so those are questions that I'm working with now because, um, you know, it, like anybody, any research is going to say, well, why you? Why did he get this experience? How did it happen? And I often say, well, that was part of my prayer in this dimension and any other. So when I open that doorway, again, uh, only the highest and best, when I open that doorway, I think something happened that we didn't know could even be a possibility. And, and so that's one of the things now 
when I work with other people in traumatic situations, which is what I have found is where my gift seems to show up strongest. Um, I have found that 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 is my prayer. And so I've had some experiences with these blue beings since who have helped other people to recover from situations that ordinarily they would not. And, you know, and it, it has, it's just stunning. And, and I'm outlining more and more of those ex- subsequent experiences that, uh, from people I've worked with after David. Wow. Well, I would love to have you and David back on for a totally separate podcast to be able to have that conversation, uh, you know, all of us together. And, and then we might also need to have a conversation about the blue beings because I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, years ago, I've worked with them, not in the capacity, I guess that you have had, like all of the people that I have worked with were not, they were not close to death. They weren't, um, experiencing any really life threatening illnesses. But Mm -hmm. I remember, I think it was maybe about five years ago is when I first began to see them. And I remember, I remember telling Mike about it offline and we were getting ready to interview Teal Swan and I hadn't told anyone about this, but I was like, Mike, you're never going to believe this healing session that I just had. And these blue beings were there and we were in this room and my client was actually on the table and they had come in and we were, you know, they were working on them and they enter my Reiki room quite often. Uh Uh-huh. Um, so, so Mike totally outs me on the show <laughs> and he was like, cause I don't know, I think, uh, Teal Swan had mentioned something about it too. And he's like, Hey April, why don't you ask Teal about those blue beings, uh, <laughs> that you saw in your session? I'm like, Oh great. Thanks Mike. Okay. I'm, I'm outed right here. So yeah, now <laughs> guess what? Everyone world, I am seeing blue beings. I didn't know either. I didn't know if I was making this up. Uh-huh. Are, are they really, um, you know, is this a real thing? And then the other recent thing that happened uh, to me, and I have it written down in a journal just this past November when I went to a meditation um, immersive with Tom Campbell, who's a nuclear physicist uh, that helped create the binaural beats with Robert Monroe at uh, the Monroe Institute. Yeah. He's a teacher of mine. Um, During one of my binaural beat sessions, the I believe what I wrote down was I asked them what their name was and they said, we are the blue healers Mm -hmm. and uh, don't quote me on that, but maybe offline I can find it and send you a separate email, but they, yeah, they had showed up and they were working on my body, um, in one of the very first sessions of this whole meditation immersive. And I was like, Hey, okay. So who are you guys? Because I see you all the time and you know, they help. I see them helping my clients and I'm very familiar with their energy and they are beautiful beautiful. I mean, just, yeah, you can't even put it into words, the essence of the energy of, uh, who they are, what they do and, uh, this beauty that they bring. And so I know who you're talking about. (laughs) Well, that is amazing to hear you say that. And I'm, I'm so looking forward to talking with you further about that. Um, because people are experiencing this all over the world. And what I found were people were, were just, scared to talk about it because again, you doubt your perception on this. It's not, it's a, it's a, you know, you're, you're seeing them with the spirit eyes and this is a, a whole different type of experience. And then to have these, these healing, the, just these beings of love who are just focused on your healing. It, it's just amazing. And so, and that is one of the things that I am doing is helping people to open their, their abilities to be able to connect with these loving healing beings because they have helped in many, many settings with people that I've worked with and, and not all critical too, like you were saying, I mean, they're there to help and they help on, on the levels where people need help. And if that means replacing trauma with healing, they do that too. It's not all just organic physical right. uh, healing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the, there's so much to be, and I'm, I'm, in fact, that's the next book that I'm working on. Ooh, so, excellent. So, so I'll love <laughs> be talking to you further about that. (laughs) Okay. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And for those of you listening, if you would like to work with Dr. Scarlett, find out more about her services, her talks and events, you can go to healingwithdrscarlett.com. And her her name is pronounced or spelled S-C-A-R-L-E-T-T.
So thank you. This was wonderful. And I really look forward to having you and David back on for, um, you know, not a shared near death experience with me, but a shared experience, a shared podcast experience together. We will have, we love that. All right. Well, thank you. And for those of you listening to, if you would like a little discount on the live stream, uh, so you can see Dr. Scarlett's presentation at the Afterlife Awareness Conference, you can go to path11productions.com, click on 2019 Afterlife Conference, and you can put in the coupon code PODCAST10. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Path 11 podcast today. I hope you all enjoyed this show. And if you haven't checked out our Patreon page, I'd like you to do so because we are going to start putting some content over there that is only for our Patreon subscribers. You can get content for as little as donating a dollar a month, and it could just be a one-time donation. We have other freebies over there that you can get depending upon how much you would like to donate. And again, it could be a one-time donation, or you can continue to keep your subscription on a monthly basis at that donation level, but I just put my MBT immersive experience, which was a four day intensive meditation training in Tennessee with physicist Tom Campbell. I was listening to binaural beats, going to altered states of consciousness, having out of body experiences and life changing experiences that I was able to bring back uh, for myself, for my clients, for my friends that was just out of this world. So if you would like to listen to that, I'd like you to head on over to path11podcast.com. You're going to see an orange button that says Patreon. Become a Patreon today and you can have access to that podcast. And I would like to remind you to head on over to path11productions.com and check out the membership that we have for the Afterlife Awareness Conference. We have over 25 hours of footage with amazing speakers like William Buhlman, Thomas John, Terry Daniel, Suzanne Geisman, Suzanne Northrup, Linda Fitch, uh, Austin Wells, just a few people uh, to name off that were amazing. These workshops are just so valuable. So I think that you would really enjoy it. It's also a great thing to think about to maybe give the gift to somebody who is struggling with grief. If you are looking for resources, this is a great conference to send people to to check out. And thanks again for listening today.